grow these five things in your garden in preparation for shortages and increased prices. Hey everybody, this is Michael with Asymmetrical Preparedness. And today we're going to talk about just that. But first, I want to thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate you guys. When you're planning your garden, it you need to come into mind, think about need versus want and variety versus production. In the past, we've grown a lot of varieties of stuff, a lot of different things, but that's not necessarily the best way to approach it. Sometimes you may just want to minimize the varieties of things that you're growing and settle on three, four, five, six different varieties that give you the best results. So that's what we're talking about in this video. Composting, a very important part of gardening. Getting proper nutrients for your soil and having the ability to amend your soil is very important. This is some chicken manure we got from our neighbors and I'm adding it to the compost bin because as of right now I've already amended all my raised beds and put them to bed for the winter. So until next season, I won't be doing anything with the raised beds. But other than chicken manure, you can add in all those veggie trimmings from cooking, all the stuff you don't need, banana peels, apple cores, all that kind of stuff, as well as um, coffee grounds, eggshells, lots of other stuff you can use um, for your compost and for amending your beds. Very, very important part of gardening because we need to make sure that our soil has all the nutrients in it, as much as possible at least, so that we grow healthy and nutrient-dense foods. Very important part of it. So I recommend you guys get into composting, even if it's in buckets. Uh, if it's a compost bin like I built here, my little redneck compost bin, um, you can do it that way. There's a lot of different ways that you can get into composting, but do it because not only are you getting good stuff for your soil so your vegetables and your fruits grow better and more nutrient dense foods, you are also cutting out, cutting down on the amount of garbage that you're producing to, that you have to pay to get rid of. So that's something to think about. So let's get to number one. These aren't any specific numerical order, but this tops my list for several reasons. It is an invasive species. It is easy to grow. It is drought resistant. It is high in protein. It is low in the glycemic index. So if you're diabetic, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and it grows, it produces a lot of food. What is it? You can see here where I trimmed the dead ones off from last year. This is Jerusalem artichokes, AKA sunchokes. I'm going to dig some up here and show you what exactly they are. Just use a flat fork when you're doing potatoes and or tubers so you don't damage them. Nice little shovel full. And let's see some Drew some artichokes. There we go. Jerusalem artichokes. Like I said, it's a tuber, just like a potato. You cook them like potatoes. You can eat them like potatoes. You can um, uh, store them long-term like potatoes. Uh, a little bit more difficult to store long-term because they have uh, a little bit more water in them, but easy pr to produce. And that one right there just gave me four tubers. So let's see what else we got here. Let's go down for another one. Up, oh, see, they grow so much that they grew into the side of this bed. They produce a lot of 
tubers. Oh, that one's split apart, so I'm probably just going to throw that one away or maybe use it today for cooking. Yeah, yeah, Jerusalem artichokes are awesome. Native Americans used to plant them along their trade routes, their um, routes, hunting routes, and travel routes, so that they knew that they always had a source of food along their routes. Uh, Jerusalem artichokes, don't know really why they're called that, because they're native to North America, and they're not artichokes, as you see. They are tubers like potatoes. I cook them up um, just like homestyle potatoes. You can make scalloped Jerusalem artichokes. You can make whatever, however you cook potatoes. Uh, one thing to note though is that because of the stuff in them, uh, I'm not a biologist um, or into chemicals and all that stuff like that, but the stuff that makes them low on the glycemic index uh, could give you gas. So what I do is if I'm using Jerusalem artichokes, I mix them with potatoes, with, what I'm, with whatever I'm making, like a four to one mix. So four, four times potatoes, one part Jerusalem artichokes, three parts, one part, whatever, until you figure out what your tolerance is. Very important. But this is awesome to grow. This one little raised bed here, you see how narrow it is and how long it is? That will produce a lot of Jerusalem artichokes. And another thing that's great about Jerusalem artichokes is because they are an invasive species and drought resistant, you can do this. See, these are the dead ones. I didn't trim them. I'm just leaving them alone, totally leaving them alone. This is my whole gorilla gardening idea. I just planted them here in the road that adjoins or goes adjacent to my property, and I just planted a bunch here. Because we produced so many over there, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plant more out here and just let them take over this whole area. Be like my little prepper uh, gorilla garden. So they'll always be here. One thing that is very important to know before you plant, before you get into gardening, is what grow zone you are. So that you know when to plant what for the best outcome. Because as preppers, we're not just doing this for fun. We don't just have a garden because we like gardening or therapeutic, which it is, but we grow so that we can produce as much food as possible, as many calories to keep our families alive or to mitigate the effects of food shortages and or inflation. So this is very important. Know your grow zone, get to know that, learn about soil pHs, types of soils, all this kind of stuff. The more you know, the better you will grow and that you will have a much better production and your learning curve will be so much better the more you learn, the more you study, the more you practice and get out there and do. If you are enjoying this video, enjoying my content, and if you really want to be truly prepared for what is coming, tough times, shortages, inflation, SHTF, whatever it may be, then join us here. Please subscribe. Hit that thumbs up, share the videos, comment below, and be engaged in the community. Stay tuned for lots of good content that is getting away from the fear, the news, and everything everybody else is doing, and getting back to the basics of actual, real-world preparedness. Then subscribe. Become part of the team. You just saw me sifting through potatoes that I'm going to use to plant for this coming season. And this is a selection of them that you just saw me sifting through. What was I looking for? I was looking for um, if they're soft, if they're rotten, if they're moldy, you know, if they're bad. Toss them out. Throw them in the compost bin. More compost to amend your soil. Um, I was looking for the best ones to use as seed potatoes for this upcoming year. 
So I have some different varieties here I want to show you. First off, we have the red potatoes. Um, just making sure they're nice and firm. Some of them already have the nice little um, growth on the eyes coming out with growth. And these also, same thing, nice growth. These red ones and these, um, uh, I forget the variety, <laughs> brain fart, but yes, these are store-bought. Those two are store-bought. These, covered in dirt still, are our homegrown potatoes from last season. And these are the ones that we selected for seed potatoes. So let me turn the camera down here a little bit so you can see them a little bit better. There you go. Um, so storing them for use for the next season. Cool, dry place. But you still need to go through them like I showed you, sifting them every once in a while. I do it every, I don't know, every couple weeks or so. I just go through them all. I take out all the bad ones so that they store properly. Um, potatoes are the next thing that we need to talk about growing. Very good, easy to grow, um, so easy that if you're not growing potatoes, you're wrong. Um, you need to make sure that they're not rotting, like I said. The easier to grow, lots of calories. Um, this bed right here is going to be a potato bed. And this bed is a, uh, about, it's like, a, what, this is about three foot by seven, or no, three by eight. Three foot wide, actually no, it's four by eight, sorry, I'm sorry, four by eight bed. And in this bed, I can grow probably at least a seven gallon bucket full of potatoes from probably all these potatoes right here would seed this bed. I'm not going to do, do different varieties in this bed. I will only do one variety. And when I'm planting, I will, for example, take this potato here with the eyes on it. So what I would do is see between these eyes, I would cut it right there. And then there's another eye over here. I maybe cut this, so thirds. So this would make three plantings. So this would grow three plants with anywhere between maybe four and seven potatoes each. So a good production for a small investment. And one bed like this, a four by eight bed, can, like I said, net you at least a seven gallon bucket full of potatoes. Probably 20, 30 pounds, I mean hundreds of potatoes. Uh, maybe even two buckets, depending on how well they grow. But potatoes are one of those things that are high in calories. It's, they're so easy to grow. They have to be in your prepper garden. Hands down, one of the best things. And who doesn't love potatoes, right? Here is another popular way to garden. In containers. One reason is uh, you don't have to till the soil. You can put a container almost anywhere. You could put it on your porch. You could put it on your lawn. You don't have to tear up your lawn. You don't have to damage anything around. You don't have to worry about building raised beds. Containers are cheap and inexpensive way to um, garden. But there are some downsides. And these are a bunch of my containers. As you see, some of them are stacked up, ready for reuse. Uh, question is, why are they all empty? Well, that's one of the negatives of container gardening, is that you do not want to leave the soil in the containers uh, too long. I don't know exactly how long, uh, but what I do, because you don't want the chemicals from the plastic to leach into the soil. So what I do is, I, at the beginning of each season, let's start off like they are now. I will go get topsoil uh, and using compost from my compost bin and dirt that I dig up around my property, I will mix it all up really well in the wheelbarrow and then I will fill these. I will use that for the season. I will grow all these containers here, will grow potatoes. I grow potatoes in my containers. So they will all grow a bunch of, pot a bunch of potatoes maybe even two full harvests. I usually get uh, a two full harvests, although sometimes the second harvest is a little bit weak, um, not as much production because it's near the end of the season. But then what I do after the harvest is I use the dirt from all these containers to top off my raised beds, like this one behind me. You can still see a bunch of the organic material uh, that I put in there that animals have dug up. But it's a great way to fill up your raised beds because they settle. And if you, same thing with this raised bed, topped off with soil from the 
containers. And you can see the Jerusalem artichokes I talked about earlier right there. Okay, so if you don't have raised beds or an in-ground area, what I would suggest doing and you want a container garden is just to take all the dirt out of the containers, put it in a pile. Now, okay, yeah, you'll have an unsightly pile of dirt somewhere, but so what? Who cares? And then what I would do is just put that same dirt back in um, at the beginning of the season. So it's not sitting in there all off-season, having those chemicals leach into the soil. But containers can be a great and easy way to garden. But one thing to think about when you're out and about in the winter, anytime it's cool outside and you're outside doing these things, like gardening, you're doing bushcrafting, you're doing anything preparedness related outside any or any outdoor activity and you want to stay warm, check out Fortress Clothing right here. Links in the description below. You should see a pop-up right there for them. Portable heat, renewable heat by your own body. Um, I'm not even wearing a shell over this. It is uh, 27 degrees out here right now. I've just been walking around doing this filming and I am perfectly warm next to the skin, nothing underneath, negative five to 65 degrees. Awesome product. I don't pimp products, hardly at all. And the only ones I do are ones I know work very well. This product is amazing. It's a game changer. If you are out and about outside, you need to have this stuff. This stuff is invaluable and well worth the price. So check it out. It is an affiliate link because I firmly believe in this company and this product. So if you want to, get some. If you don't, well, just be cold. There are other ways to go about doing it, but this is not bulky. Um, the way they design it is not bulky at all. One layer, shell, good to go. If you're colder than that, you can get some of their extreme jackets, extreme pants, their over mittens, their baklavas, anything like that. And even if you aren't outside that much right now doing stuff, when SHTF happens, you probably will be. So think about that. Think ahead, be proactive, not reactive. Get some good gear that will keep you warm while you're out doing the things. I know you wanna know what's next on the list. Coming in at number three is beans. Why beans? Because beans are easy to grow. They grow a lot of food and you can eat them in a variety of ways. My family loves to pick them as green beans. We pretty much just eat them as green beans. So it really doesn't matter what variety of bean that it ends up forming in the end because we just eat them as green beans. Um, there's pole beans and there are um, bush beans. We prefer bush beans just because, um, I don't know, just because. But we will be experimenting this year with some more pole beans because we can grow vertically so we can grow more food and make better use of our space, which is very important when we're talking about how much food we can produce. Um, you can let them go to seed, meaning produce the beans, shell them, um, and then you can put those shells in your compost or you can throw them in a green smoothie. That would be really good. Or you can dice them up, throw them in a stir fry, whatever. And then you can dry out those beans and use them like, use them beans, make baked beans, make refried beans, whatever. Um, they have protein, good amount of protein. And like I said, they're easy to grow and they produce a lot of food. This raised bed behind me that you see, the one I'm sitting on, this one, produced oh my gosh last last growing season we were producing between two and four pounds of beans every single day for about the stretch of about a month that was really good production then it slows down you know it starts building a little bit and then it slows down at the end but very good production lots of food and a variety of ways that you can use them another very important aspect of having a garden growing your own food though, is what do you do with the excess production? That's very important and us as preppers, we wanna be able to eat our good, healthy, natural foods that we grow and our kids can enjoy, our family can enjoy. Yes, fresh is best, but what do we do with the excess? Because that is to me, one of the big long-term goals. So we need to be able to preserve that food for use later on. And it needs to be in such a manner that it lasts as long as possible. It has the longest shelf life that we can provide it. So there are different ways to go about doing this. There's canning, you know, home canning in jars. There's pickling, which is also done in jars. There's freeze drying. If you got one of those Harvest Right freeze dryers, you're a lucky person. Um, those things are awesome. A buddy of mine, tribe member has one. There's also dehydrating. 
and there is um, turning into a powder, which I'll show you here in a minute. That's a really good way to preserve it also, a nutrient dense powder. So let me show you that. Yes, I'm gonna show you that nutrient powder right now, right here. And I will get into our next item with the other jar I'll show you. So what is this? This is stuff that we grew in our garden that we dehydrated. This has kale, carrot greens, which are edible, beet greens uh, and stalks, um, kohlrabi greens, collard greens, Swiss chard, and arugula. Think of all those nutrients in it. That's, I just write it on the lid. Holy cow. So what we do is we pick the leaves, harvest from the garden, we put them on baking sheets, we put them in our dehydrator, I put them at 130, 130 degrees, and I don't know how many hours it takes, we just run that thing round the clock for months. That thing ran round the clock for about four months, dehydrating everything that we produced. Not everything, but the stuff we wanted dehydrated. Okay, so then, when they're fully dehydrated, I bring them in the house, I crumple them up a little bit, I put them in a coffee grinder, and I grind it down into this powder. And then what I do is I put them, in, I just dump the powder into these mason jars until I get a, a full jar, because then I got layers of all different kinds of things, and I usually wait till I get three or four of these jars full of etc. powders. And then what I do is I get a, a stainless steel uh, bowl, like I showed you with my potatoes were in earlier, I dump it all in there, mix it up really well, and then what I do is I spread it on baking sheets again, throw it back in the dehydrator to make sure it's fully dehydrated. Then what I do is, since it's fully mixed, I let it cool off, of course, then I put it in these mason jars, and then make sure they're full up all the way, throw in an oxygen absorber, throw the lid on, and then the oxygen absorber and the, um, the um, moisture absorbers, they absorb anything in there, and then what it does is because then there's less of that stuff in there, it causes the seal to pop down. This one's not popped down because I opened it because we're using it for what? What do we use it for? Good question. I'm glad you asked. Green smoothies. You can put it in soups, stews. You could even mix some of this in with bread mixes, tortilla mixes, almost anything you make, you can put some of this stuff in just for extra added nutrients in your diet because macronutrients are important, yes. That's protein, carbs, and um, fats. <laughs> but micronutrients, all those vitamins that you need are right here, vitamin packed. All right, since I talked about storing foods and the dehydration process, I'm gonna show you the next jar and get into item number five. Beets. Beets are so awesome to grow. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but what I did is I dehydrated these. See how I sliced them up really thin, dehydrated them, put them in here, oxygen absorber, seal the lid, long-term storage. Good to go, very easy, very simple. But lesson learned, this is an older jar, it's one of my first jars that I'm slicing really thin. Well, you see there's a lot of dead space in there. So I use a lot more mason jars. So what I decided to do is I just started dicing them up. I dice them up into little tiny, you know, little tiny chunks about like, uh, let me see, about yay big, you can see on my cheek, they're about that big. And they dehydrate much, much quicker and they fit, a lot more of them fit in a jar. So that's lesson learned from that. All right, so let's talk about beets. Um, they're easy to grow, you can eat them raw, you can can them, you can pickle them, you can dehydrate them. Um, and another awesome thing about beets is you can use the greens. The greens are awesome in salads, um, stir fries, green smoothies, or to make up into this nutrient powder. Very good, um, tons of nutrients in them. I love beets. And you can cook the beet itself down, and especially sugar beets, and make a sweetener, an all natural sweetener, homegrown, organic, for whatever you're making. That's a bonus. Number five, kale. This is January 26th when I'm filming this and it's still here. It's still growing. Yes, we had snow. Yes, we had lots of freezing temperatures. Yes, we had temperatures in the low 20s. It's still growing. Kale. Why kale? 
because kale is so nutrient dense. It actually has more vitamin C than citrus fruit. So if you really want to combat those winter colds, kale is a great source of vitamin C. You can use it in stir fries, you can use it in salads, you can use it in green smoothies. Okay, you don't like the taste. A lot of people say that. Well, that's what seasonings are for. If you're making a green smoothie, that's what honey is for. That's what other fruits and berries are for. So kale is one of those things that you need to grow. It is so nutrient dense. It is a leafy vegetable. And combined with all these other things, the Jerusalem artichokes, the potatoes, the beets, the beans, those are all good things. And you can get some leafy vegetables from them also, especially like the beet greens. But you need good quality leafy greens in your diet. And kale is very easy to grow. It likes cooler weather. Like I said, it's winter time and this grew all winter. So I've just been letting it grow. We use it as we need it. I already dehydrated a lot of it for that nutrient powder you saw also. So kale is number five. It comes in at number five. There's a lot of other things I grow, but if I had to grow only five things, that probably would be what I grew. All right, so I hope you guys liked the video. I hope you guys like the new format. I hope you guys enjoy the process that I'm learning to make my videos that much better. And if you enjoy the video, don't forget, subscribe, hit that thumbs up, share the videos, comment below, let me know what you guys think about the video. Give me constructive criticism on how I can improve my content and directions that I might want to go so that I meet your needs. I love you guys. Have a wonderful day and blessings to you and yours.